And joining us right now on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line, a great friend of the show, a great guy, phenomenal writer. If you haven't read, or more importantly, I believe it's more importantly to buy the book, The Rise, The Pursuit of Immortality for Kobe Bryant, uh, Mr. Mike Sielski. Also, Inquirer, WIP is on with Glenn Macdow doing a fantastic job there as well. Mike Sielski joins the show. What's up, Mike? Mark, good to be with you, my friend. It's great to be with you. And I know I tagged you on this, but I want to go back to it because it's such a phenomenal story. A couple of months ago, the whole thing about I want my bleeping trophy back and Bryce Harper saying right when the Phillies got eliminated in the World Series, right when they lost the World Series, said, you know, we're going to add pieces, we're going to make moves and all that stuff. And I'm like, that's Bryce Harper talking. That's not the GM. That's not the president of baseball operations. But Bryce Harper knows he has the ear of John Middleton. And you made the story famous by putting it in the Inquirer about John Middleton after the 2009 World Series was in the locker room, went up to Ryan Howard, told Ryan Howard he wanted his bleeping trophy back. And that story, I think, has become the, the calling card or the battle cry of John Middleton to this day. And I think he has you to thank for that. Well, he's never thanked me for it, so I'm holding that against him. Uh, <laughs> but I, I thank you for continuing to keep the story alive because it's – uh, one of the few anecdotes that can be tied to my reporting at any point in my career. <laughs> um, but but you're right, Mark. I think, uh, and my colleague Scott Lauber wrote about this in the Inquirer the other day, and it's something that I've referenced in the past as well. John Middleton is kind of becoming the Philadelphia version of George Steinbrenner. You know, the the uh, what was the, um, the character in Jurassic park who, who creates the park and says that he, uh, yeah, John Hammond, he right, spares right, right. no expense. And that's John Middleton is he is not sparing any expense when it comes to winning another world series. And that's why the Phillies are giving Trey Turner, uh, $300 million over 11 years. That's why they gave Bryce Harper, what? $330 million over 13 years. Uh, and that's why they're probably not finished in this offseason. So uh, kudos to John Middleton because I think he's he's running the Phillies like the Phillies fan he grew up being and like I think a lot of fans of the team would run the team if they had his money. Uh, see, and I think that's what makes the story so amazing. It's that like when Chase Utley said world bleep and champions, every Phillies fan – to, to the to the most recent had said we you know world bleeping champion we said that as fans every Phillies fan I also think said in 2009 I want that bleeping trophy back or I won to win that championship I spare no expense and I think John Middleton kind of shared that same type of emotion with fans so if I could ask you this how did you come come were you in the locker room at the time did you overhear him say it how did that whole story come to be so I was working for the Bucks County Courier Times at the time in 2009, and it was right after game six of the 2009 World Series. The Yankees finished off the Phillies, uh, won that night, beat Pedro Martinez, and I happened to be one of the first people walking into the clubhouse, and when I entered, uh, John was kneeling in front of Ryan Howard as Ryan was sitting at his locker, and it was plain as day. I could hear him. Uh, he was there in front of the media, and it was what he said to Ryan in that moment. And in the aftermath, I was kind of surprised that nobody else wrote it, to be honest. Um, look, a lot of people were on deadline, uh, but it was right there in full view of people. And yeah, so that's kind of how it came to be. And it's it's held up for uh, a long time. I, I think you're right. You know, there are certain there are certain quotes that subsist and exist and linger in Philadelphia sports history, whether you're talking about Ricky Waters saying for who, for what. Uh, Jeffrey Lurie in the gold standard, uh, you know, Ed Snyder saying, you know, we don't need a fresh approach, things like that. And I think that Middleton line is, is one of them. And I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's something that's clearly on his mind, even still, I was with a group of reporters talking to John, uh, on the field after game five of the league championship series. And that topic came up again. Uh, and the fact that he wanted to finish the job, so to speak. And I think it's still driving him to this day. And to be honest, Mark, I think it led to some of the, it was some of the reason for the downturn that the Phillies underwent, you know, over the decade plus there, it was like, we got to win this world series. We got to win this world series. We're going to overpay veteran guys to try to do it. And eventually the bottom just fell out and then they tried to rebuild and that didn't go well. And it took hiring Dave Dombrowski to get them back to where they are now.
I couldn't agree more. I, my feeling was in even like 2009, 2012, 13, it was like the Phillies kept on building to win now, but they weren't good enough to win now. They kept on trying to squeeze the last drops out of the talent of Chase Utley and Jimmy Rollins and Ryan Howard until they eventually traded or let him go. So, yeah, it's unfortunate that that's the way it ended for that era with only one championship, making another World Series, obviously. But it does feel like the Phillies are certainly ready to party now, as you mentioned earlier, the acquisition to Trey Turner. And here's what amazed me. Uh, I saw your tweet with your lineup, and I swear, Mike Sealski, I swear to you, I had no idea that that was your lineup. It is almost identical. But Okay, so here's your lineup, mm -hmm. and I love it because you and I have the same thought, thought process. If you're getting Trey Turner, he's leading off for you. Schwarber, oh, yeah. you're going to have some, you're gonna have somebody on base for Kyle Schwarber. Uh, then Real Muto, I have in the same spot, Harper, Hoskins. I mean, this is almost to a T. I think I have. Castellanos and Bohm flipped. That's I think the okay. only difference in this lineup there. But you're alone. You're alone. Same line of thinking. For the record, here is my lineup yesterday. There you go. Uh, uh, Turner and Schwarber. Do you think it'll be tough to tell Kyle Schwarber, hey, you did a great job last year leading off, but how about batting second this time around? No, I don't think it'll be tough at all because of the caliber of player that Turner is. Uh, everybody knows that he's a top ten player in Major League Baseball. Uh, as much as Schwarber liked leading off and as terrific as he was in that whole pretty much all season, uh, Turner is much more of a prototypical leadoff hitter. Uh, and look, you know, you could flip flop Harper and Schwarber as well and have Schwarber bat fourth if you wanted to, uh, maybe bat Harper second, because uh, if only because, you know, once he comes back from uh, the Tommy John surgery, Harper is a better, faster base runner than Schwarber is. Um, but then you make the lineup maybe a little top heavy. I don't know. But look, this is going to be kind of part of the fun of covering the Phillies this coming season is what is the lineup going to look like? What's the effect trickle down effect going to be of Turner in the lineup? Uh, can Castellanos bounce back? Can we see a more consistent Reese Hoskins? What sort of developmental steps are Alex Gar sorry, are uh, Alec Bohm and Bryson Stott going to take? And Brandon Marsh continue to improve? and build on what he did once he came over here from the Angels. Um, you know, the, the one hesitation I have here, Mark, um, and I think this is something that you'd be familiar with and understand. The one source of discomfort, I think, that causes Philadelphia fans more angst than anything is being a favorite. I don't think it's comfortable for Philadelphia fans to go into a season saying to themselves, we are the team to beat. And having everybody acknowledge that they're the team to beat. Uh, that happened in 2002 with the Eagles. It happened 2011 with the Phillies. It happened from time to time during the Eric Lindros era. Fans have long memories here, and they prefer being the underdog or kind of coming out of nowhere to a certain degree. And that's kind of what made the 2002 run for the Phillies so, so enjoyable. It was like they were good enough to kind of make that run but you didn't really expect them to make that run and nobody really did. And so there was kind of this unfettered giving over of yourself to that team. Uh, that's going to be, I think a little harder, maybe this coming season, just because the expectations will be higher. fair enough. Uh, I do want to switch look gears at you here. greedy. <laughs> that's, that's the only way I know. I mean, look what they yeah. did. Basically they exchanged Gene Segura for Trey Turner. Like, that's insane. Um, Not bad. Not bad. And, and, and plus, I read a story about how Milton wants his bleeping trophy back. So anyway. Well, there it is. <laughs> there it is. It comes back again. Um, the Flyers, I think it's showing off. They, they've won like uh, once each week now in the last two weeks. So, <laughs> You know, here's, here's my take on the Flyers here, Mark. Oh, yeah. I, I can understand why people are uh, maybe a little annoyed with John Tortorella and his interactions publicly with the media and things like that. Uh, but this is exactly what the Flyers should be doing. They should be a bad team. Uh, you don't want to say tanking because you just don't want to say tanking. Right. But this is how you get good in the National Hockey League. And it's time that people with the Flyers and around the Flyers started to acknowledge this. I will give just one quick example of which I could give many. The Colorado Avalanche, you know, the shell of whom the Flyers just beat last night, 5-3. to three. That wasn't really a win over the Avalanche. That was a win over the Avalanche in name only. But anyway, they rolled to the Stanley Cup last year, okay? The reason they rolled to the Stanley Cup last year is because they had a team stacked with talent. Why did they have a team stacked with talent? Because they went through an 11-year stretch where they only made the playoffs three times, and they were drafting in the top 10 a ton, including getting the number one overall pick 
more than once. And it allowed them to get players like Nathan McKinnon and Gabriel Landeskong and, and Kale McCarr and a whole mess of guys who were key to them winning the Stanley Cup. And you can't have the sweet in the NHL, in the salary cap world, without having the sour first. And the Flyers have tried to put off the sour for way too long. It's fine that they're not good. They need to get a high draft pick. They need to hoard high draft picks and start getting high-end talent. Mm -hmm. And for the record, I was on board with everything John Tortorella has been saying, except for the, you guys are asking dumb questions. That one, I could have done without him. Yeah, uh, yeah I agree. It's just it's just who Tortorella is. It's, it's, too, it's too central casting for him. It's like it's mm -hmm. a perfect line for him, and it could have gone without it. Uh, Eagles better than I know. Everyone's already looking past the Giants. Everyone's already looking past the Bears. And it's like, is it Christmas Eve yet? And it's got nothing to do with Santa coming down the chimney. It's got to do with whether or not the Philadelphia Eagles are going to be better than the Dallas Cowboys with Dak Prescott in Dallas. Right now, as it stands, before you play that game, as we sit here, are the Eagles a better football team than the Dallas Cowboys? Yes. Yes, they are. They are more <laughs> consistent. You. They have more talent up and down the, the roster. They're better. Now, it doesn't mean they'll win in Dallas on Christmas Eve, uh, but it does mean they should hold off the Cowboys and win that division, and they are a better team. Okay. Uh, last thing for you here, uh, Mike Sielski. I am getting the sense, and one of the other tweets I saw yours the other night was on Joel Embiid. And you invoked a line from the Untouchables, basically, well, what are you prepared to do? And that was directed at Joel Embiid. And I have this crazy feeling, Mike, and I might be totally off base here, but I have this feeling that the fan base is looking at Joel Embiid right now and saying, we love you. You're great. We acknowledge you're great. We acknowledge that at least once maybe you were robbed of the MVP. But push has come to shove. It is time to deliver, whether that be an Eastern Conference Finals, whether that be a championship appearance, whether that be a parade. I get the sense right now that the Philadelphia 76ers fan is looking at this team and Joel Embiid in particular saying, yeah, it's all, oh, that's great. Deliver right now. Did you get an advanced column, a uh, copy of the column that I wrote that's going to appear on Inquirer.com and in the paper tomorrow? Get and out of here. Pretty, that's pretty much what I wrote, which is to say this. Look, take that game last night against the Rockets, the double overtime loss, okay? Mm -hmm. You look at the box score of that game and you see Embiid with 39 points, you see him 12 of 21 from the field, 14 to 17 from the line. You think, okay, he kept the Sixers in the game. In a game they should have won anyway against a team they should beat. And to a large degree, he did. But he committed two inexcusable turnovers and fouled out in the final 92 seconds of that first overtime. And what we're talking about here, I think what you're getting, you're putting your finger on with respect to the fan base in Embiid is what I would call like the tyranny of small differences, Right. Like Embiid is up there with Steph Curry and LeBron James and Giannis Antetokounmpo, but they're a little bit better because they have taken their teams to a place that he hasn't taken his through the culture that they, they cultivate and their work ethic and their willingness to go a little bit farther than it seems like Embiid does. Now, look, James Harden slowed that offense down to the to like till it was like cold maple syrup last night. And the bench is inconsistent at best. But they shouldn't be 12 and 12. The Sixers should not be 12 and 12. And some of that has to come down to Embiid. And I think you're right. The scene in the Untouchables that you're talking about, I put this in my column. It's that perfect scene where Sean Connery and Kevin Costner are in the church and Costner wants to catch Al Capone by sticking to the you know, he's going to use any legal means at his disposal. And Connery looks him in the eye and says, and then what are you prepared to do? And I think that's what Joel Embiid has to ask himself. Okay, you've put up all the numbers. You, you, you almost won the MVP. Everybody knows you're a great player. What next? What are you going to do now that this team can't get past that level of the second round of the playoffs? Is there something more that can be extracted from you? And are you going to deliver it? Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, I think that's where a lot of us are at right now when it comes to Joel Embiid and whether or not his production isn't just going to wield individual, uh, trophies, but also, uh, team trophies and a fine parade for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, Mike Sielski, always great catching up with you. I look forward to reading that article, inquire.com in the inquirer tomorrow. That is Wednesday is a, that, that we could uh, actually take a gander at it as well. Make sure you guys get yourselves a copy. Even if you don't like to read, like Mike told me, he knows I don't like to read, but just buy the book, uh, buy the book, the rise. Uh, it's the Kobe shopping season. Come on, let's get out there. <laughs> I saw <laughs> another tweet I saw come across was the everybody's books. You tweeted yes. everyone's books. 
Yes. And I was like, this is better than any infomercial. This is, it was Zach Berman's, it. it was Zach Berman's Underdogs. It was Ray Dittinger's book. Uh, it was yours, of course. And there was mm -hmm. one more. I can't. Uh, Leslie, Van, Leslie Van Artsel and Brian Westbrook. Oh. We're, we're all going to be at, at perfect timing, Mark. We're all going to be at Pugler's Kitchen and Tap from 6.30 to 8.30 on Wednesday night. It's in Bridgeport. Ray will be there. I'll be there. Zach, Leslie, Charlie Manuel's going to be there. We're going to be selling T-shirts and merchandise and books. Great stuff. Great beer. Come on out if you're free. That's Wednesday night. That's tonight. So we're airing this Wednesday morning. So that's tonight, mm -hmm. essentially. Yep. You got Look it. At that. Look at that. Check check Mike out right there. Uh, Mike Sealski joining us right there on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line. Mike, thanks so much, brother. Thanks, Mark.